today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. So it's come to my attention on this page that I've talked about every single Keke Genkai. I've even explained all of them. But it also recently came to my attention that that video I made almost a year ago talking about every single Keke Genkai in the entirety of Naruto didn't have a ranking. You see, in the beginning of my career, I was hesitant to rank jutsus or fights or characters because I wasn't necessarily a power scaler. And while I will still very gladly tell you I am not a power scaler, I do know enough about Naruto to tell which is the strongest and which is the weakest and what are in the middle. So I figured it was about time we revisit our friend, the Keke Genkai. More specifically, it's time we rank and explain every single Keke Genkai in Naruto. Also, if you're wondering why my setup looks different, I recently upgraded my camera setup, so I look worse. But before we get into ranking or explaining anything, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you like my new camera setup, you can see a whole lot more of it on my other page, The Weeb Commander, where instead of talking Naruto, I talk anime like Bleach, One Piece, Fire Force, even Avatar The Last Airbender. Before we get into all that, guys, today we gotta talk about a brand new sponsor to the page, Squarespace. Squarespace is a one-stop shop for helping you build your brand. Whether that brand be clothing, custom stickers, or food, Squarespace can help you grow your business. Squarespace provides you the tools to build a beautiful website, a website that will both help you engage with your audience and sell your product. Well, what are some of these tools that Squarespace provides you? Squarespace provides the tool of member areas, where creators like myself can put content behind a paywall that only those who pay to be members can access, thus creating a different revenue stream for creators or anybody who wants to put any kind of content behind a gate. But since we're talking about content, Squarespace also has a video studio tool, a tool that allows you to make beautiful videos effortlessly. This studio editor allows you to make engaging and interesting videos for your audience. And you can see how much your audience is enjoying your brand by using the analytics that are built into Squarespace. These analytics not only offer insight into how your business and or brand is doing, they also offer offer you insights on how to better improve those things. You can learn where site visits and sales are coming from and how best to capitalize on those visits. So what are you guys waiting for? Go to squarespace.com today for a free trial. And when you're ready to start your Squarespace adventure, use the code squarespace.com slash nchammer23 for 10% off your order. So what are you guys waiting for? Build that brand and maybe you'll be the person advertising for Squarespace next. So KK Genkai, arguably one of the most interesting aspects of Naruto as a whole. The combination of two nature releases is smashed together to make an even more powerful, awesome nature release. But here's the thing, there's anime only, novel only, and manga Keke Genkai. There's even movie only Keke Genkai. And while your average anime YouTuber might only consider canon Keke Genkai, I'm not a coward. Which means today we are talking about every single Keke Genkai that has ever appeared in the Naruto greater universe, ranking and explaining them. With one small little caveat, we're not gonna be talking about doujutsu because I've already done an entire video ranking and explaining all dojutsu. But dojutsu are considered Keke Genkai, so I figured to clear that up ahead of time. Today, even without dojutsus, we have 20. Yes, that's right, 20 Keke Genkai to get through. So how about I stop doing build up talk and get into the meat of this video, starting with number 20, the Iburi clan. Now, in premise, this Keke Genkai is insanely powerful. This Keke Genkai allows members of the Iburi clan to turn either partially or fully into smoke. That is to say that members of the Iburi clan could turn, let's say, their left arm into smoke to avoid a sword slash, or could turn their entire body into smoke to escape from a battle, or just to escape damage like they did with their arm. And I know what you're saying, you're saying, Nick, that sounds a lot like hydrification technique used by the Hozuki clan. And it is similar, but also has a lot of key differences. See, just like with the Hozuki clan, the Iburi clan, while smokeified, can still interact with physical objects, meaning that even though they're smoke and therefore should hypothetically be formless, they can still pick things up. But on top of this, when they enter their complete smoke form, they can also enter other people's bodies. And by entering other people's bodies, they can effectively possess them, giving them not only the ability to control the person they're possessing, but also gives them the ability to experience whatever the person they're possessing is doing. Meaning that if hypothetically, let's say they possessed me and made me eat a banana, they would taste the banana. But let's say they're done possessing said person. The Iburi clan can then, after entering somebody, oxidize their body from the inside out, effectively killing them, which sounds incredible. It's an immediate win state, right? So why, oh why, 
is this Kekagenkai on the bottom of the list. Well, this Kekagenkai is less of an ability and more of a curse. See, while the technical applications of this Kekagenkai may sound great, the Iburi clan by far and large cannot control when they smokeify, which would lead members of the Iburi clan to turn into smoke non-voluntarily. If their smokeified body gets blown by any kind of wind or any kind of wind release, they die painfully, which forced the entirety of the Iburi clan to live in caves where there was no wind in case they were to ever accidentally turn into smoke. So while having Orochimaru's curse mark did stabilize their Kekagenkai a little bit, we're not going to consider the addition of basically another Kekagenkai in the form of Orochimaru's curse mark to the Iburi clan, which means that this technique, while operating at its highest level of parameters, could be in the top five of this list. The chance that at any point you can turn into smoke and that a stiff breeze will quite literally tear your body asunder putting it at the bottom of the list. Up next, after the Iburi clan's Kekagenkai, we have Dark Release. See, Dark Release was a Kekagenkai used by Haruko in the Will of Fire. Essentially, it's a Kekagenkai that allows Haruko to pull in chakra from an enemy ninja and then manipulate and use that chakra against said enemy ninja. In essence, it sounds roughly like the Rinnegan that the Otsutsukis have in their palms, but it's not nearly as good. You see, the way that it works is that Haruko has two black diamonds on his left hand. The top diamond is the diamond that sucks in the chakra from an enemy ninja, while the bottom diamond is the diamond that shoots that chakra back. This technique allows Hiroko to do a couple of different things. He can suck all of somebody's chakra out, effectively killing them, or he can simply absorb a little bit of chakra from a ninja and find out what their key elemental release is. So let's say hypothetically he absorbed chakra from Naruto. Since Naruto's key elemental release is wind release, Hiroko would be able to use the chakra he absorbed from Naruto to use wind release ninjutsu. But there's a limit, and it's a pretty glaring one actually. See, well obviously this does technically technically confer Hiroko the ability to use all five nature releases and nullify the majority of the ninjutsu coming his way and uses an offensive weapon against ninjas that are approaching him. Should hypothetically the ninjutsu you fire at Hiroko have a shape transformation? Like the Rasen Shuriken. Even though Hiroko may be able to absorb it, he can't throw it back at you. This is because the combination of the chakra nature and the shape of it was too confusing for Hiroko's dark release, which implies that any ninjutsu with an inherent shape change is strong enough to overcome Dark Release. And there's a lot of those, which is why Dark Release is gonna sit at 19. And since we're talking about absorbing chakra, that brings us to our next entry on the list, Rinha's Keke Genkai. Never heard of Rinha? Well, that makes a lot of sense considering the fact he only exists in a video game. Specifically, Naruto Shippuden 3D, the new era. So yeah, we're doing deep cuts here. Rinha's ability is very similar to the way that corpse clone technique works. Essentially, if Rinha absorbs chakra from somebody, they're able to copy both their appearance and inherit their memories, which inherently actually makes it a lot stronger than corpse clone technique, considering the fact you don't need to kill the person and eat their brain to get their appearance and memories. And while obviously this technique is incredible for reconnaissance, essentially all you have to do is get a little bit of someone's chakra and you can sneak into the village and be them, and nobody can really prove that you're not them because you have all of their memories. It's basically just the more advanced transformation jutsu, which is why it's at 18. But if you played Naruto Shippuden 3D, the new era, tell me in the comments below, because I feel like I'm the only person on earth who's heard of this video game. But since we're talking about incredibly obscure Naruto characters whose names start with R, that brings us to Ryuzetsu's Keke Genkai. Who's Ryuzetsu, you ask? Well, he's only in Blood Prison, which is probably the best non-canon Naruto movie, I feel like. That or Will of Ninja. Maybe we'll do that sometime, ranking and explaining all of Naruto's movies. Regardless, Ryuzetsu's Keke Genkai allows him to use reincarnation technique. Specifically, it allows him the ability to use something called Dragon Life Reincarnation, which allows him to bring somebody back from the dead by transforming transferring his life into their body. Well, transferring his life force into their body. However, because Ryuzetsu is transferring his life force into a dead person's body, he dies. So in essence, it's one's own life jutsu, the one that Granite Shio made to save Gara. Well, she didn't make it to save Gara, she made it to give life to puppets, but you get it. The ability to bring somebody back to life is obviously incredible, but the fact that it kills you is why it's so low on the list. But ladies and gentlemen, you've all been waiting very patiently, which is why next on the list, we're doing our first canon Kekagenkai, and I'm gonna get a lot of flack for it, explosion release. I just heard a collective grow and a couple of screams from the back. What do I mean explosion release is the 16th strongest Kekagenkai? Well, the problem that we're running into is that a lot of you, when you hear explosion release, are probably thinking of Daedara, which is fair. However, to say that Daedara's power comes from his explosion release is a stretch. You see, explosion release is the combination of earth and lightning nature releases. It's also the first Kekagenkai on this list whose combination of natures we actually know. Explosion release is 
most commonly seen in members of Iwa's Explosion Corps. And while we don't know what the Explosion Corps do, we do know that there's a group of ninjas within Iwa, the Hidden Stone, that have access to Explosion Release. We've seen technically three users of Explosion Release in the entirety of Naruto's timeline, Data Agari and a man in Sasuke Shinden who is being controlled by Genjutsu. But for the sake of today's video, we're only going to talk about Gari and Deidara. And of those two, Gari is probably the better representation of what Explosion Release can do. You see, Gari uses Explosion Release to add explosions to his Taijutsu, which for all intents and purposes is very powerful, especially when you consider the fact that anything he comes into contact with explodes from the inside out. Terrifying, nobody wants to be bombed. But this means that this Kekagenkai, in order to be used against an opponent, means you have to physically hit them with your body, implying that if the average person wants literally any futility out of explosion release whatsoever, their taijutsu has to be superhuman. Because once you come into contact with the highest upper echelon of ninjas, their taijutsu is gonna be so good that the average ninja, even if they have explosion release, won't be able to hit them. The other circumstance is Daedara, obviously. But Daedara's power doesn't come from his explosion release. I mean, it certainly helps. But Daedara actually stole a Kinjutsu from Iwa on his way out of the village. A Kinjutsu that allowed Daedara to open his hand mouths and his chest mouth. And in these hand mouths and chest mouths, he's able to knead his own chakra into clay. And because Daedara has an explosion release Kaike Genkai, he's able to knead explosion chakra into this clay. Without that Kinjutsu, Daedara would be exactly like Gari, stuck trying to come into contact with people so their explosions can have a meaningful end. So to use Zedera, who had to acquire a very forbidden Kinjutsu in order to make explosion release relative as an example, like I said, is a bit of a stretch. Unfortunately for all you ladies and gentlemen, we are now heading back to novel only territory. Because next up on the list is Mud Release. Haven't heard of Mud Release? That's because it only exists in Akatsuki Heated, a light novel comprised of stories about what the Akatsuki did when they weren't either getting killed or killing Jinjuriki. It's probably Naruto's best light novel. I'd recommend giving it a read. Mud Release is the combination of water and earth chakra releases. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, Nick, those are the combinations for wood release. And you're right. It is also the combination for wood release. But that was kind of a good thing for Mud Release users because nobody thought that Mud Release existed because the combination already belonged to Wood Release. In fact, when Hidan met the Wood Release user that he meets in his chapter with Kakazu, he thought Mud Release was a lie. But it's not. It's very real. And in fact, it's relatively powerful. In fact, it allowed one user of Mud Release to fight on par with Hidan and Kakazu for a little bit. So obviously, Mud Release operates a lot like Magnet Release. Essentially, by combining the earth and water around them, the user is able to control large masses of earth. And the way that we've seen Mud Release use is kind of terrifying, actually. You see, we've seen Mud Release used in very similar ways to Magnet Release, specifically the way that Garo uses his sand. See, the only known practitioner of Mud Release is Amayuki. And we saw Amayuki use an ability called Mud Doll, which is a bit like a sand clone or a wood clone in that it can incur a lot of damage before it disappears. However, the way it's different from a sand clone or a wood clone is if a mud clone catches you, it can force its hand down your throat and drown you, which is also the idea of Mud Release Bottomless Mud Hole, where if you have the unfortunate privilege of being somewhere a Mud Release user is, they can essentially create quicksand, but it's mud, you sink into it, and you drown. On top of this, Amayuki was able to create a landslide that quite literally leveled an entire village in a valley. So to say that that alone is probably stronger than Explosion Release, doesn't seem that inaccurate to me. Up next, we're returning back to manga canon with Scorch Release. You see, I hear a couple of the more seasoned Naruto weebs going, how is Scorch Release this low? And that's because you're probably thinking of Scorch Release as the combination of Sasuke's fire style and Naruto's wind style, which during the war arc, they do dub technically as Scorch Release. But that's never sat right with me. Listen, I have nothing against Naruto and Sasuke doing collaborative attacks. It's incredibly cool to watch. But you're telling me that two people combine Finding singular nature elements to make one attack counts as a Keke Genkai? It just doesn't sit right with me because a Keke Genkai is supposed to be individual. I'd be like saying if somebody was standing on water and I threw a little bit of lightning into the water that I called it Storm Release. Yes, obviously Naruto and Sasuke's Scorch Release could be talked about as quite possibly the strongest Keke Genkai on this list. But I want to talk about Scorch Release in a truer, more organic, genuine fashion, and that would be when Pakura uses it. You see, Pakura is a ninja from the Hidden Sand, and she used the combat combination of fire and wind release to create scorch release that she would use to attack enemies. Now what did this scorch release do? Essentially it made fireballs so hot that if they came into contact with you it would immediately evaporate all of the water in your body. Effectively, immediately, and permanently 
mummifying you, which is terrifying if it hits you. You see, having a one-hit KO like that is obviously an incredibly powerful thing. In fact, I would easily say that Scorch Release has the most killability in terms of immediacy on this list thus far. Even Explosion Release, if you're fighting anybody with relatively high durability, wouldn't kill somebody in one hit. But Scorch Release does have a glaring weakness, and that's... It, it's just water. Basically, anything at Jonin level or high water release can basically completely nullify Scorch Release from the jump. Meaning against people like Chunin or Lower, those who don't specialize in water release, this is an incredibly powerful jutsu, but against anybody with real chops and real nature releases and experience in water release, it's basically useless. After Scorch release, we're actually staying in manga canon territory with Sakon in Ukon's Keke Genkai. You see, this Keke Genkai was unfortunately seriously nerfed considering the fact that Sakon and Ukon were effectively fighting against Geni. This right here is my first situation of separating the art from the artist. See, the way that Sakon and Ukon's Kekagenkai works is that they're basically able to break down their bodies to a molecular level, which means that they have control of their body down to its own molecules, meaning that basically any form, shape, size that they wanted to take, they could do. And while we only ever saw Sakon and Ukon use this ability to meld their bodies together and have either four arms or four legs or two heads or crawl into Kiba's body, there was so much more they could have accomplished with this Keke Genkai. As your resident scientist weeb, having molecular control of your body can do a lot of things. They could have become a gas. They could have spread their bodies out miles wide. Human bodies are very dense with molecules. All of this around me, not dense with molecules. I mean, it is dense with molecules relative to things like the vacuum of space, but like, I'm not getting into the specifics here. Sakon and Ukon, if they could retain consciousness while being in a gaseous state, could have been breathable. Do you know? How terrifying that is. They could have spread themselves incredibly thin and been the perfect reconnaissance weapons. They could slip themselves into your drink. Any cut on your body, they could have simply aerosolized themselves and crawled in through. And I know what you're saying, you're saying, well, Nick, they could only really break down into a liquid. It is specifically stated they could break their body down on a molecular level, which means they could control their density. Not to mention, by being able to control the density of their body, they would be effectively unhittable. They would be close to the perfect version of the Iburi clan. And once again, yet yeah, all we saw was them melt into each other and then climb into Kiba. But the problem is if they climb into somebody else's body, for some reason, they feel the same pain as the person whose body they've climbed into, which I guess makes sense when you consider the fact that in order to control somebody's body, you do have to tap into their nerve system. But you know what Sakon and Ukon could do that they just didn't do against Kiba? They could just spawn their fist in the middle of his brain. There's quite literally nothing stopping them from doing that. And yet they had to spawn a hand and a head on his body to try and make him stab himself. They could have just spawned a hand around his heart and squeezed. Since it wasn't them trying to control his body, they wouldn't be tapped into his central nervous system. They wouldn't have felt a thing except a little pop. But since this Keke Genkai wasn't used in this way, I can't be like, oh, this is the strongest thing of all time because what if it simply just can't be used that way? So for that, it sits at unlucky number 13. Speaking of unlucky though, next up on our list, we have Shinkatsum Yaku, also known as the Keke Genkai of the Kaguya clan, most notably used by Kimimaru. Shinkatsum Yaku was a rare Keke Genkai even amongst the Kaguya clan, so much so that even members of the Kaguya clan were afraid to the point of purposely avoiding whoever and inherited Shikatsum Yaku. And that makes sense because the Keke Genkai itself is pretty terrifying. Essentially, any user of the Shikatsum Yaku is able to control their bones freely. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, Nick, so can I. First off, that's not you controlling your own bones. You can't actually move your own bones. You just move the muscle and the skin around them and the bones kind of go along for the ride. Second, by control the bones, I mean that any user of Shinkatsum Yaku is able to grow their own bones out of their body. Kimimaru is able to do things like extend his rib cage to act as a protector around his body. So should you come in for a flying kick into Kimimaru's midsection, he can simply shoot out his rib cage to stop your kick. And while you think, oh, I'll just break his ribs, the user of Shinkatsum 
Yaku's bones are harder than steel, which is why Kimimaru does things like pull his spine out of his back to use as a sword. Because the obvious second ability of the Shikatsumyaku is that any bones taken out of the body are immediately restored. Otherwise, Kimimaru pulling out his own spine would have been less cool and more sad. Kimimaru is also able to fire his own finger knuckle bones out of the tips of his fingers like bullets. And considering the fact that these bones are controlled by Kimimaru, even outside of his own body, he can both control their trajectory and their spin, which is important if hypothetically, let's say these bone bullets hit something they can't penetrate immediately. Since Kimimaru is in control of these bones, even after they've been fired, they can keep spinning, which is why Kimimaru's bone bullets were almost able to penetrate Gara's perfect defense. So not only does his jutsu basically operate as a perfect defense, as anybody who tries to attack you will basically get skewered on steel hard bones, it also gives you basically an automatic weapon in your hand like your Franklin and the ability to pull a sword out of your back like your Geralt? So the Keke Genkai itself is the perfect combination of offense and defense, which is why Kimimaru, even though he was significantly ill, was able to effectively beat both Gara and Lee in a fight. Though obviously a lot of that strength also came from his curse mark. Since we're not considering curse marks or outside factors when we're talking about these Keke Genkais, I can't give curse mark strength Kimimaru to the conversation of Shikatsum Yaku. Though obviously he also would have been stronger without the chakra disease, so it's kind of a yin yang thing. Also, small caveat here, Gara at this time wasn't using his other Keke Genkai outside of magnet release, because Gara actually doesn't have magnet release. He was just given the ability to control sand by Shukaku. Gara's Keke Genkai is actually the ability to weave chakra into his sand to increase its density, but he didn't use that Keke Genkai until substantially later in his life because he inherited that Keke Genkai from Rasa, his father, who he doesn't like. So if hypothetically Gara was using Using his own Kika Genkai to make his sand stronger and denser, Kimaro's bones probably would have bounced off. But what do I know? I've only read Gara's light novel four times. And since we're talking about light novels, we're going back to light novel only Kika Genkais with Steel Release. Yes, you heard me right, Steel Release. We're not entirely sure what combinations of nature you need to make Steel Release. My guess is Earth and Fire, but that would also be Lava Release. But we've seen Steel Release used a couple of different ways. In Gar Hidden, we saw somebody use Steel Release to create steel weapons from basically midair. I guess it's kind of just the same thing as what 1010 does. It is a bit more useful than 1010s though, because obviously this person doesn't have to pull out a scroll and hit a summoning seal. Essentially, if you're about to attack them, they can summon a steel weapon to block your attack. However, once again though, tapping back into Hiroko from Will of Fire, he was able to steal a steel release Keke Genkai that allowed him to harden his body into steel, making him essentially Mr. One from One Piece. And with a steel body, his body was basically all but indestructible. Therefore, hypothetically, we can infer that steel release at its highest level of use allows you to make your body into steel and make steel weapons, which is like Shikatsum Yaku in that it is the perfect blend of defense in offense, but it's unlike Shikatsum Yaku because things like the head of a user of Shikatsum Yaku can't have bones grown out of them for defense. But since we're talking about making weapons out of midair, that brings us to our next entry on the list ice release. See, while a lot of people might think that we've only ever seen one user of ice release in Haku, we've actually seen four users of ice release, and every single one of them uses it very differently. Well, obviously Haku used ice release to create mirrors that he could teleport between instantly, which when you combine with Senbon is an incredibly powerful technique, Sasuke is also able to use ice release, being shown in Sasuke Retsudan to be able to create an ice kunai that he used to stab a dinosaur. On top of that, in Kakashi Hiden, we are introduced to two additional ice users, Kaho and Raho. Kaho was able to place ice particles on people's bodies that would grow, and if the person who this ice particle was placed on didn't constantly use chakra to keep their body warm, they would freeze to death, while Raho was able to add ice to his hands and feet to increase the power of his punches. But when we're genuinely talking about ice release, the real person we should be talking about is of course Haku. You see, one would believe that ice release would inherently have a weakness to fire release. With a fireball or two, the ice melts and then bing bang boom, Haku who is left powerless. However, Ice Release has been shown to be resistant to both heat and fire several times, which means that Haku's Ice Release really has no weaknesses. And when you consider the fact that the only other thing in the universe that allows somebody to teleport instantaneously is flying Raijin, that puts Haku's ice release in an upper echelon of jutsus. Now, obviously the scope and size of the teleportation is significantly smaller than that of flying Raijin, but still the maneuverability that being able to teleport between ice mirrors on a battlefield gives a user 
is not to be understated. On top of that, there's actually a fifth user of Ice Release that I forgot about. Ryogi is able to shoot out Ice Shards out of their hand. So when you combine all of these Ice Release techniques, you get a very formidable Keke Genkai. Imagine if Haku could just shoot out Ice Particles as he bumped around from mirror to mirror, or if he was able to place an Ice Particle on you that would make you essentially freeze to death, which is why Ice Release gets our first spot in the top 10. The Keke Genkai that gets our second spot in the top 10 is Lava Release. Oh, by the way, I should mention that Ice Release is the combination of water and wind nature releases, while Lava Release is the combination of fire and earth. But Lava Release is weird, because Lava Release is rarely lava. In fact, there's four known users of Lava Release, and every single one of them has a different form of Lava Release. The only user of Lava Release that actually shoots out lava is Son Goku and his respective Jinchuriki. Much in the same way that being the Jinchuriki of Shukaku gives you the ability to control sand and maybe even Magnet Release, by being the Jinchuriki of Son Goku, you get access to Lava Release. The circumstance in which we saw this flesh out was with Roshi, who was able to make lava in both its solid and, I guess you could consider it liquid for. Siroshi was able to spit out molten rocks as well as more liquid lava. Now, while technically we've seen Meitamari, the fifth Mizukage, able to also use molten lava, when she used it during the five Kage summit, more often than not, her lava release expresses itself as acidic mud. Essentially, she's able to spit out acidic mud that can melt anything it comes into contact with, which is very similar to lava, but different. While lava melts things away because of the heat, Mai's acidic mud melts things away because of its acidity. But while we're talking about Lady Kage's Korotsuchi, the fourth Suche Kage is also able to use lava release. But her lava release manifests as either quicklime or volcanic ash. Korotsuchi's quicklime is essentially concrete. It's a molten rock that after spit out will eventually harden, and therefore it's more used by Korotsuchi to bind large entities such as the Ten Tails. However, on top of it being technically concrete that will harden with time, this quicklime is also corrupted corrosive, which means not only will you soon be stuck in place, but this corrosive quicklime will also burn away your skin and your bones and everything. On top of this, with her volcanic ash, she's able to restrain an enemy or simply confuse them. Korotsuchi is able to restrain and or bind enemies with this technique because the volcanic ash is thick enough to wrap around opponents and bind them. And lastly, a ninja from the hidden cloud named Dodai is able to make a vulcanized rubber using his lava release. This rubber is good for nullifying impacts and lightning release, because since lightning can't travel through rubber, it basically nullifies any type of lightning attack. On top of that, like the rest of the lava techniques, it's really good for binding people. Because I don't know if you've ever tried to rip rubber, but it's all but impossible. And because of the versatility of lava release and the myriad of different ways it can be applied to certain people's fighting styles, it's very powerful. And that's just when you consider the offensive capabilities of it, when you consider things like binding techniques and fuinjutsu that come along with it, it's undeniably a top 10 Keke Genkai. However, what stops it from being a top 5 or a top 3 Keke Genkai Kai is general lack of range. Lava is heavy and therefore very hard to spew far. However, that is not the case for our next Keke Genkai on this list, Foil Release. Foil Release is similar to Lava Release in that there isn't really one true form. Every user of Boil Release seems to have a different iteration of what Boil Release means to them. When Mei, the fifth Mizukage, uses her Boil Release, it comes out as an acidic fog. And Mei is actually able to control the acidity of said fog. And Mei is actually able to expel this fog at such a rate that she's able to fill rooms in a matter of seconds, which is terrifying when you consider the fact that if May hypothetically wanted this fog to be incredibly acidic, anything that this fog came into contact with after a couple of moments, let's say three to five seconds, would start melting. We've even seen that this fog is strong enough when controlled by May to melt a Susano rib cage. And while obviously this isn't the completed form of Susano, it's still one of the stronger defensive mechanisms in the entirety of Naruto. But this isn't the only way that Boyo release is used. In the same way that Son Goku was able to confer a kick again, Kai to his Jinchuriki, Kukyo is also able to confer a Kage Genkai to hers. Except in this circumstance, it's not lava release, it's boil release. More specifically, it's referred to as steam release. Oh, this is also a good time to mention that boil release is a combination of fire and water chakra releases. This steam release is Kukyo and or Han label it, allows either Kukyo or the Jinchuriki of Kukyo to superheat their own chakra. And by superheating their own chakra by using the heat of steam, they're able to achieve speed and strength feats that are unheard of. Essentially, since chakra is the life force of all things and basically controls muscle movement, strength, and speed, if hypothetically you increase the rate at which your chakra flows through your own body, you can get superhuman strength and speed. And it was with this ability that Han, who was seven foot tall, was known to be the fastest user of Taijutsu alive. And yes, 
he lived in the era of my guy. On top of this, Han is also able to apply steam around his body, which he can use to apply melting forces to his taijutsu. So when you consider the AoE effect and the superhuman plus the strength and speed you can get from this Keke Genkai, I think it's pretty undeniable it's stronger than Lava Release. But is it? stronger than Jugo's clan's Keke Genkai. See, we don't know a whole lot about Jugo's clan's Keke Genkai because Jugo is the only person from his clan we've ever met. But we do know that Orochimaru built his entire curse mark around the existence of said Keke Genkai. Specifically, the Keke Genkai's ability to always be pulling in nature energy and basically making anybody from Jugo's clan limitlessly filled with chakra. This is to say that basically by having Jugo's clan's Keke Genkai, you become a perfect sage, but you become more perfect than a perfect sage. Because even the most perfect of perfect sages still need to sit still in order to pull in nature energy. This was the case for both Hashirama and Naruto. Hashirama would stand atop his wood release and move his wood release while he himself stood still gathering nature chakra. Naruto used his shadow clones in different locations to pull in nature chakra and once they disappear, he gets it. Jugo doesn't have to worry about any of that. Constantly, anytime throughout the day, Jugo, without any external effort, is pulling in nature energy. Meaning that stamina-wise, he's hypothetically infinite. Unless, of course, he pulls in too much nature energy, in which case he turns into kind of like a nature energy monster that wants to murder everything around him. And this is the tightrope you walk with this Keke Genkai. But when you consider the fact that Jugo not only is able to pull in basically infinite nature chakra, but he's also able to manipulate his body to have rocket boosters to increase the strength of his punch that burn off that nature energy, you get an almost limitlessly stamina monster that even if they use too much of their Keke Genkai, will just turn into a stronger monster that still probably wants to kill you. When you consider the fact that the strength of this Keke Genkai was able to keep Sasuke neck and neck with Naruto for a matter of years, pretty undeniable that it's one of the stronger Keke Genkais in the show. But since we're talking about Sasuke, we should talk about a Keke Genkai that got introduced to us from a Sasuke light novel, specifically Sasuke Shinden Book of Sunshine, or the last couple of episodes of Naruto Shippuden because they actually decided to animate it, which was weird. You see, in this storyline, we're introduced to Nowaki, and Nowaki is able to use an ability called Typhoon Release, which is different from Storm Release. The weird thing about Typhoon Release, though, is we only know one of the elements that comprises it, and that's Wind Release. And we only know that because Typhoon Release, for all intents and purposes, is basically just Wind Release. But like, really, really strong Wind Release. You see, Typhoon Release basically operates very similarly to Tamari's Summit. You know the little weasel with the sickle that was able to make tornadoes to cut down entire forests? That's basically what Typhoon Release is. Typhoon Release allows Milwaukee to make giant typhoons and vortex and tornadoes with his wind release. These vortexes are so powerful they can decimate surroundings, such as a forest or a stadium. But more than that, we actually saw Nawaki cover an entire island with vortexes using his typhoon release. In fact, Nawaki was able to make a variation of his typhoon release so large, it was the same size as a full body Susano from Sasuke. And while it didn't defeat Sasuke Susano, it did put it on the defensive. And the fact that Sasuke had to use his Susano in the first place should point you in the direction that Typhoon release easily deserves to be in our top five. I just remembered that it's actually number six. Only because the other five are stronger though. Which is why we need to talk about the form that everybody mixes up with Typhoon next. Storm Release. Storm Release is insanely powerful for a couple of reasons. Its versatility is probably the number one reason though. See, Storm Release is a combination of water and lightning release. And Storm Release seems to take that very literally. Because the most notable user of Storm Release we've seen is Darui, who's able to use a technique known as Storm Release Laser Circus. This technique allows Darui to make lightning that can flow like water. That is to say that this lightning can bend and change direction and crash. And it's not just one streak of lightning, it's dozens of streaks of lightning, all being fired in different directions, being controlled individually to hit individual targets. Meaning that Darui can aim at a dozen people and hit every single one of them with an individual laser beam. And since obviously this technique is a combination of water and lightning, the strength of this ability is not to be undersold. You don't want to be hit with lightning, let alone lightning while it's wet. The other user of Storm Release is Madara, which if Madara uses it, you know it's gotta be in the top five at least. See, Madara uses the ability Sage Art Storm Release Light Fang, which is essentially what happens when Madara gets a bunch of Senjutsu Chakra into his mouth and then he forms it 
into a literal laser beam. This laser beam, when fired, travels at the speed of light and is strong enough to cut a truth seeker orb in half. Why is that impressive? A truth seeker orb is a Keke Mora, which means it's comprised of all five chakra releases and yin and yang. You hypothetically should not be able to destroy them, and really the only reason that this was able to destroy them is because it was made of Senjutsu chakra. But also, I feel like we breezed over that first part. It travels at the speed of light, which means it's basically impossible to dodge, and it cut the world's hardest object in half. It's the worst thing to come out of a mouth since Boruto was proposed. And I'm gonna get flack for this next choice, and I'm honestly kind of surprised it made it this far down, but I already wrote it down on the notepad, so we gotta stick with it. Next up is Crystal Release. I can make this work. Sure, I just explained that Madara had light speed and laser beads coming out of his mouth. But, uh, I can make this work. Crystal Release is an anime only Kekagenkai used by a lady by the name of Gurin. And I know I just said it should have made this far down the list, but it is, for all intents and purposes, hilariously insane. Crystal Release allows the user of Crystal Release to basically crystallize any physical matter. Whether that physical matter be air, water, earth, wood, anything can be crystallized. And not just like tiny little baby crystals, massive human-sized crystals that can deflect basically anything. Crystals are, after all, incredibly hard. In fact, amongst control-type Kekagenkais like Magnet and Wood Release, Crystal Release probably controls the hardest element, which is why Crystal Release is actually incredibly powerful. It's stronger than the majority of physical materials that will be used against it. And therefore, as you try to attack a user of Crystal Release, they can just crystallize wherever you're about to attack, and most likely your attack will be deflected. On top of that, users of Crystal Release can crystallize huge humans, meaning that not only do they have the perfect defense in terms of super hard rocks that are basically impenetrable, should they get their hands on you, they can put you in a crystal. And unless the crystal release is released, you're staying in that crystal. And if should hypothetically somebody strike the crystal and break it, it would kill the person inside. See, while we technically don't know what comprises crystal release, Kiba hypothesizes that it's earth release, we do know that it has basically one and only one weakness. It can be broken, specifically by those who are incredibly talented with either lightning release or the ability to manipulate sound waves. Because if you shake a crystal or really any solid at the right frequency, it'll shatter. On top of that, crystal release can't crystallize jutsu because they don't have physical form, they're only made of chakra. But honestly, this isn't the world's biggest problem because crystal release has been shown to be able to break things like water release, earth release, and wood release. Therefore, the only true weakness that any crystal release user would really run into would be those who are incredibly well practitioned in lightning release. Because how many people are you gonna run into that are able to control bats that can shoot out sound waves that break your crystals? That's how this arc ends. You know what? No, I feel comfortable with that decision. And I feel even more comfortable with this decision because coming in at number three is magnet release. I mean, come on, this was obvious, but I won't. Magnet release, like lava and boiler release, operates differently for different people. But the differences are certainly less noticeable. See, magnet release allows you to control things that are magnetic, which is why magnet release is kind of weird actually what do i mean well there's three true instances of magnet release we've seen at least talking about in the current capacity that i've explained rasa was able to use his magnetic release to control gold dust and since his gold dust was usually tied in with sand it was kind of like a golden sand well the third kaze kage whose name we don't know was able to control iron sand and shinki and boruto was also able to do this the problem is gold isn't magnetic like at all so why was rasa able to control gold with magnet release not really sure. So let's say for argument's sake, the magnet release allows you to control finite metal and or earthen particles. Regardless of how it technically works, this power is incredibly powerful. The most powerful iteration is the one we'll talk about, the ability to control iron sand. By being able to control iron sand, people like Shinki and the third Kazekage can basically make whatever constructs they want out of iron sand to use either offensively or defensively. Shinki is shown covering himself in an iron sand cloak, which he can use to deflect basically all incoming attacks. Should an attack become from basically anywhere he's covered. And since this iron sand is mostly iron, his defense is quite literally iron. And therefore, it's going to be more powerful than basically anything coming in to attack Shinki. On top of that, Shinki and Gaara and the third Kazekage can create massive hands that can grab onto people, increasing their range and destructive power. But the true strongest user we've seen of this magnet release isn't even technically a user of magnet release. Like I stated with Gaara earlier, he's not able to control sand because he has magnet release. That ability was gifted to him by Shukaku. But Shukaku does have the magnet release Kekagenkai, so let's say that hypothetically Gaara has it as well. We've 
we've seen Gara able to cover entire battlefields with sand and use sand burial on the entirety of it. This is saying that Gara is able to cover entire battlefields in a sand and then kill anybody in that sand by increasing the pressure of said sand. We've seen Gara stop meteors from Madara with the help of Inoki. We've seen Gara stop a bomb that would have destroyed the entirety of the hidden sand. Gara is also able to cover himself in a sand armor. He's able to make sand clones that can stand up to significantly more beating than a shadow clone. He can create an eye that can float and do reconnaissance for him. His mother lives in his sand gourd and acts as a perfect defense that he doesn't have to control. And on top of all of that, by being able to control sand or iron sand or gold dust, all of these users can levitate sand or iron or gold dust and fly. On top of that, magnet release is usually used for fuinjutsu. Things like Gara's Grand Sand Mausoleum have been shown to hold Otsutsukis for numerous hours, while Rasa was able to fight against Shukaku multiple times and seal him every single time. Now, obviously, there's some innate weaknesses with using metal, like lightning, but Shinki has shown the ability that even in the face of some of the greatest lightning used in the show with Mitsuki's snake lightning, to recover, meaning that the weakness probably isn't that much of a weakness. But you know what doesn't have a weakness? The next entry on this list, Wood Release. I know, I can hear everybody screaming, what? Wood release is at number two? Wait until I tell you about number one, okay? So yes, for the moment, wood release is our second strongest Kekagenkai of all time. Wood release does exactly what it sounds like. It allows you to create and manipulate wood. And while it doesn't sound nearly as powerful as things like crystal release or magnet release, it is for a couple of reasons. One, the scale at which it can be controlled and two, the implications of controlling wood. See, obviously the most important wood user we've ever seen was Hashirama. And in combination with his Sage Mode, Hashirama was able to pull off things like true thousand arm Kanon, which essentially allowed Hashirama to create a Buddhist 1000 armed God out of wood. And this Buddhist 1000 armed God is so powerful. It was able to punch a Susano off of Kurama while Madara was riding him. On top of that, we've seen Hashirama create wood golems that are able to go toe to toe with Madara's complete Susana. We've seen him create wooden dragons that he can fire at opponents. We've even seen him use abilities like Deep Forest Emergence that can quite literally transform a battlefield. On top of that, Hashirama's Deep Forest Emergence does have the added ability of having flowers grow on his tree that can release sleep toxins that can knock out an entire battlefield. And should you hypothetically breathe in too many of these toxins, you will also die. Hashirama's wood release is so powerful that it's stated that the only reason Konoha is truly hidden in the leaves is because Hashirama made the entire forest around Konoha. So that's it for the scale. But what about the implication? It's because you're on a boat. Where are you gonna go? If you don't get that joke, I'm not explaining it to you. Wood release for some reason that's never really Explained? Is it explained? Suppresses Tailed Beast Chakra, meaning that if hypothetically Hashirama was to wrap up a Tailed Beast with his wood release, the Tailed Beast would start to lose its chakra, which made Hashirama the great equalizer against the strength of the Tailed Beasts. Because of this, once again, Hashirama is able to create things like his heavenly gates that are able to hold down the likes of the Ten Tails, meaning that in a world populated by nine basically walking natural disasters, Hashirama had a power that equalized him against them, allowing him to capture eight of the nine Tailed beast with no real struggle and play an important role in the battle against the ten tails but in a world where you fairy very much have to worry about tailed beasts especially concerning the fact madara is trying to use them to wipe out the entirety of the world wood releases usefulness becomes exponentially more useful but nick you just explained to keke genkai that was able to suppress the ten tails and punch a susano off the strongest tailed beast in existence what on earth could possibly be stronger than that i'll tell you right now you're gonna hate the answer, but unfortunately, it's the right one. The real strongest Kekagenkai of all time is the Kurama clan Kekagenkai. See, the Kurama clan is a clan that lives within the confines of Konoha, and as a clan, they are incredibly well-versed in Genjutsu. However, once every couple of generations, a true prodigy is born. A child with a proclivity for Genjutsu at the age of five that masters in the clan only achieved at 50. A child with so much strength in their Genjutsu prowess that they can make Genjutsu real. See, the big thing about Genjutsu is that it's not real, and therefore, if you understand it's happening, Happening, you can dispel it. Obviously, there's some exceptions to this rule, like Tsukiyomi. But the Kurama clan's secret Kekagenkai that only appears once every couple of generations makes Tsukiyomi, quite literally, seem like child's play. See, this Kekagenkai makes the prodigy's Genjutsu so powerful that it becomes real to the person it's being inflicted upon. Let's say, hypothetically, you cast me under a Genjutsu. If you stab me in that Genjutsu, I'll be like, ouch, and then I'll wake up and I'll be fine. Maybe I'll remember how much it hurt to be stabbed, but 
I'll be fine. If the wielder of this Kekigenkai puts you under Genjutsu, it will become so real that your brain will make a stab wound where I was stabbed. Meaning that if hypothetically, let's talk about Tsukiyo. Kakashi was stabbed by Itachi for 72 hours in the span of what, a second? If Itachi was the user of this Kekigenkai, Kakashi would have came out of that Genjutsu with 72 hours of stab wounds. He would have died a million times over. This is the power of this Keke Genkai, but it applies to more than just a personal level. See, the only user of this Keke Genkai that we know is Yakuma, and Yakuma was able to make a Genjutsu about lightning hitting the Hokage's office reality. On top of this, she was able to cast Genjutsu over the entirety of Konoha simultaneously, meaning that this Keke Genkai Genjutsu prowess doesn't only apply to an individual level, being able to make a person who feels as though they've been afflicted in a Genjutsu's wounds reality, it gives her the ability to quite literally make reality whatever her Genjutsu is, essentially giving her reality manipulation power. So if hypothetically in a Genjutsu she cast over the entirety of Konoha, she decided to kill every single person with blonde hair, Naruto would have been gone. The only other person stated with the ability to make Genjutsu a reality in the Naruto universe is Kaguya. Now, obviously what comes along with this Kekigenkai is also an entity that lives inside of you referred to as id that every time you use this Kekigenkai tries to take over your body. And that's not a great side effect. But in terms of what somebody can accomplish with this Kekigenkai, hypothetically, Yakumo could have just gone to the battlefield of the fourth great Shinobi World War, used her Genjutsu and just erased the Ten Tails. So while I'm sorry that's the number one strongest Kekigenkai, it's reality. Just like with Genjutsu, reality is what I make it. And that's it. All Kekigenkai and Naruto ranked and explained. Guys, do you agree with my list? Or do you want other things placed in different spots? Tell me in the comments below. And while you guys are down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. I got LED light strips, so now I'm a real gamer boy.